the Sengoku period, an era of conflict rife with war and desolation, a period mired by the ambition of men and their ceaseless pursuit of power. Before long, a man by the name Ishin Ashina grew tired of the despotic rule his land and people had suffered, a rule led by General Tamura. Driven by the unshakable belief that this province belongs to the Ashina clan, Ishin sets the stage for rebellion. He united his people and enlisted the aid of great warriors such as the Shinobi Orangutan, the Shinobi Owl, Lady Butterfly and Gaiobu the Demon. The Shinobi Orangutan was a deadly fighter who once trained in the Sunken Valley with his partner Kingfisher. Joining him was the Shinobi Owl, a tenacious warrior of immense strength. Lady Butterfly hailed from the forest of the Owl, a land north of Ashina, a master of illusions and known associate of the great Shinobi. She too joined the uprising. Some time ago, Gayobu Masataka Oniwa was once a ruthless bandit leader who was bested by Ishin. Although victorious, Ishin was fascinated by Gayobu's fortitude and so opted to recruit him to his cause, and so Ishin had assembled a force few could hope to rival. Leading his forces, the clan lays waste to the opposing faction, painting the land in a hue of crimson. Eventually, Ishin would arrive in a field of golden reeds, where he would at last confront the towering General Tamura. Only his death can grant Ishin dominion. The two partake in a duel, Tamura choosing to brandish a cross spear, while Ishin dons a katana. With a clash of steel, the sword saint proves his name, executing the general, cementing his legacy as one of the greatest swordsmen to have ever lived. Witnessing the slaughter of their leader, the ranks of Tamara scattered to the wind. With this act, Ishin had solidified his clan's place amongst the upper echelons of Japan. In the midst of this battle, Gaiobu's horn spear was shattered, and so Ishin gifted him Tamara's weapon, a fine prize for his aid. His generosity extended to his most ardent followers, granting them the title Seven Spears of Ashina. They were pivotal in Ishin's coup. He awarded the lance to none but his most loyal samurai. Now victorious, the Sword Saints relocates to the lavish halls of Ashina Castle, where he would usher in a new rule. However, his reign eventually provoked the ire of the Interior Ministry, who had their own agenda in regards to the province. Ishin would go on to adopt a child, raising him as a grandson. Born a peasant, Genichiro was taken in by the Ashina after his mother's death. With his country on the brink of defeat, Genichiro took to heretical arts and mastered the lightning of Tomoe. Such heresy may be the key to saving her. The Sword Saint coveted strength and all manner of techniques throughout his mortal struggle. Once mastered, many of these techniques would go on to form the basis of Ashina's combat style. The training also stretched to his ranks. Ishin would often stop by unannounced just to keep his students on their toes. Over time, the ferocity of Ashina's army gained renown throughout the nation. Its generals were especially talented, every one of them accomplished in the Ashina sword style. Once the battle had been won, the shinobi's orangutan, an owl, scoured the land. The orangutan finds a malnourished child on the verge of starvation. Her name was Emma. Understanding the life of a shinobi is not one for a child, he presented her to a known associate of his, Lord Dogen, a proficient doctor. Dogen adopted the child, and soon she would become a practitioner of medicine. Among the ashes, Al discovered a young boy. Al took in the hungry cub on a whim and raised him as a shinobi. Al, similar to Dogen, adopts the child, but he would not view Sekiro as his own son. Without hesitation, his training began, a long, gruelling process designed to test the wolf's limits and shape him into something greater. Al once abandoned the young wolf in Usui forest expecting him to fend against the illusions, likely never to return. Only in victory would he recognize the boy as his son. In this way, and this way alone, he raised the wolf as his own.
In reality, this act of abandonment was another form of training, conducted by Lady Butterfly, under the orders of Owl. Eventually, the wolf would become a master shinobi, rivalled only by his father. Owl now recognised Sekiro as one of his own. The conniving shinobi, however, saw the boy as a tool, rather than as a son. He was no use to him if he could not serve. As instructed by his father, Sekiro obeys the shinobi code, a decree in which the father's word is absolute, the master he serves is second. This meant that regardless who Sekiro was tasked to protect, Al's orders would overrule his masters, and so his position as the boy's father was more of an authoritative role used to manipulate the child, making him obey every order without question. Ultimately, Sekiro was tasked by Al to serve the divine heir, Lord Kuro, the last remaining descendant of an ancient bloodline a boy raised in isolation by the minister of Ashina, Hirata. Owl emphasises the importance of this mission, as he orders Sekiro to defend the child with his life, and should he be taken, to bring him back at any cost. Over the course of 20 years, the rule of the Ashina clan was tested, and soon their grip over the land began to slip. In an act of desperation, the Ashina clan abducts Kuro, leaving Sekiro with nothing. His father now absent, and the child he swore to protect gone, the wolf's morale was broken. That is until he's greeted by a mysterious woman, who provides him with an ornamental letter. The parchment reads, Kuro's wolf, your destiny awaits you at the Moonview Tower. Escape from the well, and find the tower bathed in moonlight. Even without a blade, you can reach it. Stay silent, stay vigilant. Before we continue, let's take a minute to talk about today's sponsor. This video is brought to you by NordVPN. Nord allows you to connect to one of over 5,500 servers in 59 countries with one simple click of a button. NordVPN is known for its amazing speed, hailed as the fastest VPN there is. You can use it on up to six devices on every major platform. Why would I need a VPN, you may ask? A VPN provides an encrypted server which hides your IP address from corporations, online spies and would-be hackers. If you're scrolling through Netflix and can't find your favourite movie or TV show, all you need to do is open the map, click on a location that's streaming said movie or TV show, and voila, now you can watch it. For the gamers out there, with NordVPN you can play securely, blocking malware-ridden websites and eliminating the threat of a DDoS attack, which can significantly slow down your connection. All you have to do is click the first link in the description, or go to nordvpn.com slash brothers code, as shown here on screen. Get a two year plan, and not only will you receive a huge discount, but also four months for free. It's a no brainer, as there is no risk, with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. Once again, please click on the first link in the description, or go to nordvpn.com slash brothers code, and try out NordVPN for yourself. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the video. Following the instructions, etched into the latter, he stealthily manoeuvres to the tower. Devoid of a weapon, the wolf has no choice but to avoid the Ashina swordsman, stationed around the perimeter. A task he can achieve with relative ease. After all, removing one's presence is part of what defines a shinobi. Shortly after, Sekiro comes upon the Moonview Tower. To his surprise, Kuro is held captive within. As they converse, Kuro returns a katana named Kusabi Maru, an heirloom of the Hirata family, a cadet branch descended from Ashina. Once thought lost, it has found its way back into the hands of the wolf. The name Kusabi Maru beseeches a shinobi's role is to kill, but even a shinobi must not forget mercy, a mantra the blade itself may manifest. 
Furthermore, a healing gourd is provided, a gourd filled with vitality-restoring medicine, made by an apprentice of the extraordinary Dr. Dogen. Though, it is strange that the gourd's medicinal waters refill automatically. The seeds within may hold the secret to how it works. The apprentice mentioned here is most likely Emma, the adopted daughter of Lord Dogen. Emma provided the divine heir with a healing gourd should he require treatment. If Sekiro is to serve as the sword of Kuro, he must have the means to restore his vitality. Recognizing this, Kuro offers this healing apparatus to the shinobi. The boy is the last living descendant of an ancient clan, a faction whose bloodline is referred to as the Dragon's Heritage, a unique ability enabling one to avoid death. This power also extends to Sekiro, as he is under Kuro's immortal oath. For this reason, the Ashina clan set their gaze upon the Divine Heir, as the ability to be impervious to death would surely grant the clan uncontestable leadership over the province. However, this immortality was not without consequence. Should a person who is gifted with the dragon's heritage perish, an affliction spreads through the land, a sickness known as dragon rot. Essentially, the more Sekiro or Kuro dies, the more the disease spreads across the inhabitants of Ashina. There was once another divine heir by the name Tokeru and his vassal Tomoe. At this time, it is unknown what happened to Takeru, but all will be revealed at a later point. It is said that the Ashina clan attempted to emulate the power of the dragon. One such method was by ingesting the rejuvenating waters, which, similar to the dragon's heritage, also stems from the blood of a divine dragon found within the fabled Fountainhead Palace. Similar to Kuro's gift, this too granted a form of immortality, yet also came at a price. The rejuvenating waters was not only a source of power for the clan, but also an inspiration for their fighting technique. The Ashina style is deeply rooted in the flow of the Fountainhead waters. As the rule of the clan diminished, they resorted to abducting Kuro. In a frantic attempt to extend their rule, Kuro states, there's a secret passage beneath the moat bridge that will take us out of the castle. Lord Ishin told me about it once. In wake of this revelation, the wolf learns that Ishin, the grandfather of Genichiro, is aiding Kuro in his escape. Nevertheless, the divine heir was safe for now. Sekiro, armed with his sword and the means to restore his own vitality, clears the area. It is here where the wolf encounters leader Shigenori Yamauchi. The adversary is incapacitated with a death blow, a technique in which one must exhale, expelling both regret in order to reaffirm one's core to regain posture. Together, Kuro and the shinobi navigate through a small passage until they enter a field of silver grass. As they edge ever closer to the borders of the province, their escape is impeded. Under pale moonlight, they are confronted by Lord Genichiro Ashina, the adopted grandson of the legendary Ishin. Escape would not be so easy. Genichiro reminds Kuro of their last encounter during the funeral of his uncle, reminding him of his duty to family, insinuating that Kuro should have faith in his own blood and grant them the divine blessing. The wolf stumbles for his sword and prepares to confront his strongest foe yet. Sekiro proves to be no match. He is facing the apprentice of the sword saint after all. With a flash, Sekiro's arm is decapitated and Kuro is taken once more. If Ishin was aiding Kuro, then clearly Genichiro is acting independently of his grandfather. There is no doubt that he wishes to harness the power of the dragon's heritage for the sake of preservation. Defeated, Sekiro finds himself at death's door once again. But due to his oath-bound connection to Kuro, the dragon's heritage grants him life once more. He awakens in a dilapidated temple, a humble place of worship. In close proximity resides the sculptor, 
it is revealed that he had dragged Sekiro back to the temple, where he could regain his strength, suggesting he supports the wolf's cause. He states, So you're awake. Looks like death is not your fate, just yet. Your eyes, the eyes of a wolf who has failed in his duties, or so it seems to me. I must carve the Buddha. You do what you will. Having lost his hand, Sekiro soon discovers that a shinobi prosthetic has been attached to his limb. It functions as more than just an arm, a means of expanding Sekiro's arsenal, a versatile tool used by shinobi for traversal, defense, and combat. The sculptor's intimate knowledge of the shinobi and his ease of identifying one is not coincidental, for he too once shared the same profession. He went by the name Orangutan, the very same warrior who participated in Ishin's coup two decades prior. What led a great shinobi to abandon his occupation and dwell in an isolated temple? History tells us that Orangutan almost fell victim to Shura. The word Shura means carnage, and it is what awaits those who kill, for the act of taking a life is not without consequence. With each light one extinguishes, their humanity sinks further into the abyss, until nothing is left but a tormented, empty husk, filled with animosity. A being unable to think logically or recall their past, their immense power is further increased by the flames of Shura that emanate from the individual, a physical manifestation of one's rage. Only a single thought occupies their mind, the death of all around them, friend or foe. Once someone becomes Shura, little can be done to stop them. This reveals that the sculptor must have been a prolific shinobi in the past, who had massacred so many individuals that it almost transformed him completely. While Orangutan was on the brink of becoming Shura, it was the swift decisiveness of Ishin that saved his life. The Sword Saint, using a cruciform cut in the blink of an eye, severs the sculptor's arm, and in so doing, restored the man to a calm state of mind. For now, the flames of Shura would not consume him. The doctor, Lord Dogen, then manufactured a prototype shinobi prosthetic, specifically to replace Orangutan's lost limb. The prototype provided a basis for all prosthetics to come after. From this device, the shinobi arm was eventually constructed, one of which was given to Sekiro. The shinobi prosthetic is the perfect tool for combining movement and attack into one, ensuring no movement is wasted. It is heavy as it is made from iron machinery. Despite that, it can be used in the air, thanks to the techniques of its creator Dogen and the training of its owner. For the item to function, it requires a steady supply of spirit emblems. These artifacts are manifestations of regret. Those regretful of their vile actions are haunted by many spirit emblems. After a brief conversation, Sekiro leads the sculptor to his own devices. He continues to carve many Buddhas by hand, a gesture symbolizing his atonement. Perhaps he feels regret for the many lives he claimed, or perhaps he is repenting for what lies ahead, as the flames of Shura may yet burn in his heart. Nearby, Emma can be found. She appears to be fascinated by the white marking on the face of Sekiro a side effect of his powers of resurrection. Noticing the healing gourd in Sekiro's possession, she knows that she had given it to Kuro for his own use. It appears as though the divine heir had given it to Sekiro, anticipating that the two may be separated. She goes on to explain that the flask contains gourd seeds, a seed which secretes an infinite supply of healing water. The twisted gourd of medicinal waters was known throughout Ashina since long ago, but it was the extraordinary healer Dogen and his pupil Emma who discovered the self-replenishing nature of this seed. She also recounts how a dragon rot epidemic once gripped the land and every victim afflicted by the illness perished. One of her goals is to manufacture a cure, 
to prevent such a tragedy from reoccurring. To this end, she requests that Sekiro collect blood samples of infected victims and to bring them back to her for studying. Lastly, Emma states that she serves a master, yet despite questioning from the wolf, she will not reveal who this person is. Nonetheless, she offers to aid the shinobi on his journey. Hanbei the Undying is stationed outside the temple. As his title would suggest, Hanbei too is immortal. During his childhood, a monk placed a centipede within his emaciated frame. The insect burrowed its way into his body, reanimating the samurai. Like many others, Hanbei was defeated by Ishin during the rebellion. Aimless, the immortal swordsman wandered the land until he was attacked by a man called Shaokichi. The man mistook Hanbei for a bandit. Suzu, Shaokichi's sister, feeling empathetic to Hanbei's plight, offered him a place to stay. To repay this kindness, Hanbei would lend his sword. He even saved Shaokichi from being butchered by a unit of Ashina soldiers. At one point in time, he called for Hanbei's aid once more, imploring him to investigate the nearby forest, as many villagers who had entered the woodland were yet to return. Following the trail of the deceased, they encountered a recluse individual, driven to insanity. His eyes pierced the darkness with a red glow. The man had clearly lost his mind and resorted to cannibalism, explaining the missing village folk. Hanbei engages the man, but soon after, a creature known as the Guardian Ape appears and consumes the Manic Hermit. Upon investigation, it is discovered that the deranged man was an experiment of the surgeon Dujin. He too sent the Ashina soldiers to spy on the Hermit, to safeguard and analyse his experiment. The same soldiers who Hanbei had killed earlier to protect Shaokichi. The father of one of the men who fell victim to Hanbei's sword plotted revenge. He kidnapped Suzu in order to lure Hanbei to the abandoned dungeon. The father, using Dujin's rejuvenating waters, had healed his son. Here they lay in wait to ambush the unsuspecting Hanbei. During this fateful encounter, Shaokichi gives his life to protect Hanbei. Standing alone, the eternal warrior emerges victorious. Dujin agrees to release Suzu. The woman's mind was broken, and so Hanbei offered mercy with his blade. The undying samurai was alone once more. With the blood of Suzu on his hands, he believed he had committed a cardinal sin. As a result, he journeyed to the dilapidated temple. He would now use his powers to aid others on his road to redemption. Although many would consider his immortality a gift, he views life as a curse. He offers to spar with Sekiro to sharpen the wolf's skills in combat. If defeated, Hanbei will spring back to life. Sadly, as of this moment, Sekiro cannot grant Hanbei the respite he desires. Moving forward, Sekiro leaves the safe confines of the temple behind and enters Ashina outskirts. Before long, the shinobi encounters a chained ogre a gargantuan man who appears to be yet another victim of Dujin's experiments, as indicated by his red eyes. The erratic beast wails with no regard. The subject is too far gone, and so Sekiro delivers a death blow, granting mercy to the tortured man. Soon after, the shinobi encounters a man called Inosuke Nogami, a vassal of the Hirata family. The samurai appears to be mortally wounded, conjuring the strength to speak. He implores Sekiro to look after the old woman in the house close by. This woman is Inosuke's mother. The timid maid appears to be ringing a small bell. She refers to Sekiro as her own son, mistaking him for Inosuke. Sekiro informs her that he is not her son. Despite this, she grants the young lord's bell charm to the wolf, requesting that he offer it to Buddha for the sake of her young master. The identity of the one she serves remains ambiguous for now. Heeding her words, Sekiro pockets the charm and departs. 
atop an overlook, a strange merchant offers to sell his wares. This figure belongs to a group of tradesmen called the Memorial Mob. The items they sell have been pillaged from the dead. Many such merchants can be found throughout the province of Ashina. A distinct item can be found in the possession of this merchant, Robert's Firecrackers, an item from across the Southern Seas, sold by little Robert and his father to raise funds for their travels. Their voyage brought them to Japan, where they would seek the undying in an attempt to extend Robert's life. From this information, we learn of a man from the West and his son Robert. It is no secret that the key to eternal life lies within Ashina province, and so Robert's father desperately searches for it to cure his son's terminal affliction. Surrounding the outskirts are vast mountains and valleys, dangerous as they are beautiful. Several tunnel networks form a passage in the mountainside. Dwelling deep within the caverns are undead creatures of the dark, known as the Headless, once living mortals who were beheaded in life, a common occurrence in the Sengoku period. Warriors would often collect the heads of their enemies in exchange for money, titles and land. Victims of such barbaric acts could not find peace in the afterlife due to their incomplete burials, as an aspect of their body was owned by another never to be laid to rest. These malformed warriors are impervious to the blade. In order to slay these spirits, one must coat their blade in divine confetti. It is imbued with a divine blessing, made for driving away apparitions. The paper is made ceremoniously, whereby pulp is spread thin using water from the exalted fountain head. As the gods bless the waters, so too will the confetti bless one who basks in its touch, allowing attacks to connect with apparition-type enemies. Sekiro, with this tool, is able to grant peace to the headless. Jumping forward, we witness the fabled Great Serpent, a monolithic, white-scaled snake, a vast creature whose body weaves through the mountains. Sekiro cannot confront such a beast head-on, the shinobi, using his expertise and stealth, narrowly avoids the jaws of the serpent. Eventually, Sekiro comes upon a small palanquin, in which he hides. The snake grows suspicious, leaning against the entrance of the structure to take a closer look. Seizing the opportunity, Sekiro plunges his blade deep into the cornea of the great serpent, resulting in the beast recoiling in terror and pain granting Sekiro ample time to make an escape for now. Advancing further, we arrive at what appears to be the remnants of a battlefield. A gateway can be seen in the distance. The entrance to Ashina Castle is within reach. However, there is another obstacle to overcome, Kayobu Masataka Oniwa, the once bandit leader and ally of Ishin the Sword Saint. Wielding the crossbear of General Tamura, the samurai charges on horseback. Sekiro has no choice but to overcome this adversary. He cannot fail Kuro. The wolf perseveres, deflecting the blows of Gaiobu's armament and using his grappling hook to throw the warrior off balance and close the distance. Gaiobu, the demon, is unable to best the master shinobi. Sekiro delivers a piercing blow to the chest of the samurai, felling the great warrior. And with that, the keeper of Ashina Castle Gate was defeated. At a certain point in time, Sekiro is able to circle back to Ashina Reservoir. Here he discovers the pit at which he awoke from earlier. At the mouth of the chasm, a man called Jinzaiman Kamano can be found. His duty is to patrol the moat of Ashina Castle. He states, Shinobi, have you heard the shamisen yet? I followed the sound, and it led me to this well. I don't know why, but I can't stop thinking about it. The sound of the instrument appears to occupy the mind of the patrolman. Interestingly, only he can hear the melody of the supposed shamisen. Curious, the wolf plunges into the pit, where he comes face to face with a lone shadow. These nimble warriors pose a significant threat to Sekiro. 
using a mixture of martial arts and their katana to make quick work of their enemies. The wolf endeavours and overcomes the shinobi. The lone shadows are the interior ministry's most trusted agents. Each of leader Masatsuna Orobe's 17 born has a specialty, from poison to shinobi hounds. Here is the first sign that the interior ministry has begun reconnaissance in the province of Ashina, setting the groundworks for an invasion. Further beyond, Sekiro encounters the Shura storyteller. She warns that the worst is yet to come for Ashina, stating that the fires of war still burn as embers, signifying that Ashura may return soon. As stated earlier, we know the sculptor was once on the brink of Shura. Perhaps the old maid is referring to him, insinuating that his transformation was merely delayed, not prevented. Surrounded by a group of deceased lone shadows is the Tengu of Ashina, a tall and lean shinobi wearing a Tengu mask. He remarks that Sekiro reminds him of a certain one-armed wolf, suggesting he is familiar with the shinobi orangutan. He asks that Sekiro go and kill the rats in Ashina, rat being a nickname for a particular stout assassin found nearby. Once completed, Tengu will provide the Ashina esoteric text as a reward. The text reads like a history of Ishin Ashina's battles. When young, Ishin fought desperately, time and time again, polishing his technique in the blood of his enemies. He consolidated his learnings under the Ashina style name for the sake of his clan's dominance. When encountered for a second time, the shinobi will grant yet another text. Young Ishin would stop at nothing in his lust for power, and this single-minded search for strength ended in him taking Ashina for his own. This is the result of combining techniques from the styles he encountered. This drive defined Ishin's achievements, and as such, this text will never be finished. The possession of these items would indicate Tengu to be a devout follower of the Sword Saint. But, if we take into account his knowledge of the Shinobi Orangutan and the specific text regarding Ishin, it lends credence to the notion that Tengu is most likely the Sword Saint himself, masked as a Shinobi, cleaning up Ashina in his twilight years, witnessing the perpetual demise of his clan. Perhaps he could no longer sit idly by, choosing to aid his grandson Genichiro in the restoration of Ashina's glory through his own means. Before venturing further, Sekiro recalls the young lord's bell charm, gifted by Inosuke's mother, and so the wolf returns to the dilapidated temple. As instructed, he offers the charm to Buddha in prayer. As the shinobi closes his eyes, he is transported three years into the past, into a memory, awakening at Hirata Estate. The residents of the Hirata family appears to be under siege by a troop of bandits. A wounded Nightjar ninja recognises Sekiro as the son of Owl. Additionally, he urges him to protect the Divine Heir. From this information, Sekiro realises that Kuro's life is in danger and that the bandits have attacked the estate in search of the boy, presumably for his power. In the vicinity, we encounter Pot Noble Harunaga, a man infatuated with the idea of becoming a carp in order to achieve immortality. He was exiled from the Fountainhead Palace due to his attempt to slaughter a mythical creature known as the Great Coloured Carp. He implores Sekiro to bring him any treasure carp scales he can to aid in his journey of becoming a fish. Should Sekiro fulfil this request, the Pot Noble will grant the wolf some truly precious bait, to lure the great treasure carp and kill it, to succeed where he could not. After a period of time, Harunaga will mutate into a red-eyed carp, red eyes being a symptom of those who pursued eternal life. Prior to his transformation, he revealed that his goal was to become the next great coloured carp, another objective in which he failed. In the distance, Sekiro encounters spear-wielding monks from the temple of Mizen. 
Mizen monks are well versed in the art of killing shinobi, an undertaking that demands a body with an unshakable core. We can discern that Hirata foresaw the malicious intent that some would have, if they realised the location of the divine heir Kuro. Intriguingly, he expected an invasion orchestrated by the shinobi, choosing to enlist the aid of Mizen monks to defend his land. This was not a simple attack by a group of roaming bandits. Descending deeper into the estate, a merchant by the name Anayama the Peddler is discovered. This bandit merchant offers to sell his wares as a prize. Strangely, this man can also be encountered in the present day outskirts of the province. If spoken to in Ashina, Anayama will recognise Sekiro, recalling their chance encounter at Hirata Estate three years prior, providing a bridge between the memory and current events. Incidentally, should Sekiro kill the peddler in Hirata Estate, he will then vanish from Ashina outskirts altogether, enforcing the idea that the wolf has travelled through time, and his actions will have a rippling effect on his present day. Journeying ahead, Sekiro enters the bamboo thicket slope, where he is reunited with his father, Owl. It's you, I'm afraid I made a bit of a blunder. Perhaps the years have finally caught up with me. Don't bother tending to my wounds, no point. It's too late. <sighs> Wolf, you must take this. The key to the secret temple in the estate mansion. You'll find him. The divine heir. With his dying breath, Owl gives Sekiro the hidden temple key, allowing him to gain access to a concealed location where Kuro is held. Is it possible that a great shinobi such as Owl would be defeated by a group of bandits or Mizen monks? His passing appears suspicious and potentially calculated. For now, Sekiro has no choice but to push forward through the estate. Navigating the flaming wreathed village, he comes upon a stalwart samurai named Nogami Gensai. He declares that his duty is to protect the young Lord Kuro, and that Lord Ishin would never forgive him should he fail. From his dialogue, we also learn that he was involved with Ishin's coup, aiding him in his insurgency. Moreover, he requests that Sekiro assist him in the upcoming fight to carve a path to the temple entrance. Unsurprisingly, the hidden temple appears to be the most heavily defended area. Leading a pack of bandits is the gargantuan Juzo the Drunkard, an unrivaled sumo wrestler who once served a great feudal lord. Dismissed after giving to drink, he fell to a life of brigandry, and so he was dubbed Juzo the Drunkard. Together, Sekiro and Nogami cut down the colossal foe, granting passage to the temple. Upon entry, Sekiro is reunited with a familiar figure, Inosuke Nogami's mother. You may recall she provided the wolf with the young lord's bell charm in order to gain entry to this memory. Her appearance in Hirata estate indicates that the master she once served was Lord Kuro. Once again, mistaking Sekiro for her son, she asks that he protect the divine heir. Close by, Inosuke can be found. His eyes appear to be gouged out, witnessing the illusions permeating from the temple. Perhaps Inosuke purposely blinded himself, or this could merely be a wound received from an adversary. Unsuccessful in his attempt to rescue Kuro, he instead provides the shinobi with a snap seed to aid in the fight ahead. The seed is useful for breaking the effect of illusion techniques. If an illusion occurs, it is because someone created it. To crush the phantoms and return to reality, one must defeat the creator of the illusion. At last, Sekiro hears the cries of Kuro, lamenting the loss of his parents. The divine heir appears to be under the effects of an illusion, something which the wolf frees him from. An old acquaintance calls out from the flames. The seasoned practitioner of illusions and once mentor to Sekiro, Lady Butterfly. 
Fulfilling his duty, Sekiro instructs the child to run. Curiously, the boy does not recognize the one-armed wolf, suggesting that this memory emerges from a time before the boy employed his service. Or perhaps Sekiro safeguarded the child from the shadows, invisible to his eyes. If Sekiro was already duty bound to protect Kuro at this point, then even more suspicion is placed on Owl, as the Great Shinobi is the only one capable of ordering Sekiro to leave the Divine Heir's side, since his word as father supersedes that of the master he serves. The butterfly is as graceful as she is deadly, employing the use of daggers to inflict rapid and relentless cuts. She also suspends herself in the air, balancing upon tripwires from which she lunges. Skillfully, Sekiro is able to counter her movements, eliminating the shinobi. But Lady Butterfly would not be defeated so easily. It is revealed that Sekiro was merely dueling an apparition of hers formed by her mystic powers. With her illusion defeated, the true Lady Butterfly appears, descending from the shoulders of a large Buddha statue. Throughout the fight, she conjures a plethora of warriors, proving her skill in the art of illusion. Regardless, the apprentice had surpassed the master. Filled with anguish, the wolf delivers a death blow to his former trainer, asking that she forgive him for this act. In her final moments, Lady Butterfly acknowledges the wolf's newfound strength. As the hidden temple collapses, someone, wielding a vast blade, delivers a mortal blow to Sekiro, a weapon that appears to be oddly familiar. For now, it appears the true perpetrator of the massacre at Hirata Estate remains unknown. As the wolf succumbs to his wounds, unable to confront the one who had assailed him. The events of Harata Estate are but a small indication of the lengths many will go to to obtain the power of the dragon's heritage. Much of the conflict afflicting this land is rooted in the pursuit of immortality. As the wolf's consciousness slips into the void, the diviner Kuro returns, granting the shinobi his blood a reward for his loyalty. It is worth mentioning that Sekiro is already oath-bound to the present-day Kuro. The younger Divine Heir, granting him his blood for a second time, results in a Sakura droplet, a pale pink crystal residue known to form when an immortal oath fails to establish. Increase his resurrective power to allow an additional resurrection. To repeat the vows of the Undying and be awarded resurrective power once more surely necessitates the aid of a divine child of the dragon's heritage. Since Sekiro had already received this gift, obtaining Kuro's blood once more had little effect. For now, the droplet is worthless without the assistance of a divine child. As life returns to the one-armed wolf, he awakens in the present day. Retracing his steps, the shinobi returns to the location of Inosuke and his mother. This time, Sekiro is greeted by a corpse. The once maid appears to have perished while the wolf was away. Wistfully, her son Inosuke states, oh, Mother, until the end, the young master. He recounts that his mother even in her deteriorating mental state, remained loyal to Lord Kuro. Her giving Sekiro Kuro's charm was an attempt at reconciling her failure to protect the boy on that dreadful night three years ago. Sadly, she would not live to see the child again, and her son Inosuke would soon join her in the beyond. In pursuit of Kuro, Sekiro makes his way to Ashina Castle. Before entering the grounds of the keep, one last foe must be slain, the Blazing Bull, an almost indomitable creature. The Ashina soldiers had bound a bale of straw to the frame of the beast. The stack was then ignited, spiraling the creature into a fit of blind rage, a desperate last line of defense conjured by the Ashina clan. The bull does not discriminate, as it tramples its captors and enemies alike, with no sense of strategy. The bull was a fiery, rampaging beast, and nothing more. 
the one-armed wolf fells the animal, granting him salvation. At the mouth of a bridge resides the faithful one, a devout old woman. When speaking to her, she unveils that one must journey to Sempo Temple, located on Mount Congo, should one hope to meet a very special and holy person. Thank heavens. Thank heavens, divine child of the rejuvenating waters. Thank you. You, you wish to meet the divine child? That way, Senpo Temple is that way. Pass through the abandoned dungeon. Swim the cold waters. That will take you right to the Senpo Temple on Mount Congo. Unlike Kuro, this divine child was created artificially by the Senpo monks, in an attempt to replicate the power of immortality bestowed upon those of the dragon's heritage. The monks relinquished their pious ways, and their vision became clouded by delusions of eternal life. The false dragon's blood that courses through the child's veins allows her to transcend death. She was not the only victim of such experimentation, as the monks tried to grant immortality to several children. Unfortunately, only one would survive, the divine child of rejuvenation herself. But for now, Sekiro remains focused on the rescue of Kuro. The inner confines of the castle are not so easily penetrated. Countless troops, and even a general of the Ashina clan, serve as an iron wall of defence against any intruder. Joining the countless soldiers are the Taro Troopers, tall, bulky fighters. Their gargantuan stature is most likely the result of consuming persimmons. The Ashina Taro Troop are practically raised on these fruits, which is why they all know the best time to pick them. An individual known as Black Cat Badger also makes an appearance for the first time. He looks very similar to the assassins found throughout Ashina. He remarks, Rats have been swarming into Ashina Castle these days. You know the ones I mean. But there's this hell-bent old-timer cutting them up like it was nothing. Specifically, he mentions the Shinobi Tengu, and how he has been eliminating the assassins. Anticipating the danger that lies ahead for Ashina Castle, the Badger leaves for Senpo Temple. Navigating the streets of the castle, the one-armed wolf meets Fujioka, the info broker. This merchant once belonged to the memorial mob, however, he has chosen to become an independent seller. His habitual trait of looting corpses and turning their wares for a profit still persists, despite having left the group. He states that some of the Ashina samurai around the keep have been chasing him day and night, but he is reluctant to reveal why they are after him. Perhaps the Ashina soldiers did not take kindly to the looting of the corpses of their brethren. Sekiro complies, assassinating the unit of samurai. Indebted, Fujioka offers a nightjar beacon memo as compensation, a note on smoke signals used by Ashina Shinobi, the Grey Nightjars. Pale pink smoke signals are placed along the rooftops of Ashina Castle. These signals guide the nightjar. The ashen-feathered flock are surely the only ones able to follow such a trail. Here we learn of the Ashina Shinobi, known as Nightjars. Three ranks form this sect of ninjas, brown, grey, and black, as indicated by their masks. They often use smoke to communicate the way to one another, and those of their faction are supposedly the only ones able to follow such a signal. However, Sekiro is a master shinobi, and so he too is able to traverse the rooftops of Ashina Castle, following the trails of smoke as guidance. Having reached the summit of the castle, Sekiro overhears Genichiro and Emma conversing. Desperate to cure his grandfather's affliction, Genichiro pleads for Kuro to take him into his immortal oath, to grant him the power of the dragon's heritage. The divine heir rejects this notion, leaving Genichiro with no choice but to dispose of the oath-bound Sekiro, so he can take his place. With newfound confidence, the shinobi draws his sword. During the duel, 
Genichiro utilizes dexterity and raw strength to overcome his opponent. His arsenal consists of his katana and long bow, which he uses to barrage the one-armed wolf from all distances and angles. Sekiro had gained much combat proficiency since their initial encounter. Having rapidly bridged the gap in skill, the grandson of Ishin is bested. Genichiro, however, does not falter, now displaying little semblance of the man encountered in the reservoir. He enters his strongest form. Not only was the Lord trained by the Sword Saint, but also the legendary Tamawe. Combining the techniques of Ishin and Tomoe allows Genichiro to reach a level of skill few could dream to achieve. Replicating the dance-like movements of the floating passage art, taught to him by his master, the sound of thunder roars through the frigid skies. While an Ashina combat art, it was taught by an outsider, and as such is considered heretical. The master of this technique crossed the floating passage and descended to Ashina. Her name was Tomoe. Some theorize her to be of the Okami clan, a sisterhood of warriors who resided in Fountainhead Palace and wielded lightning as a weapon. Using the way of Tomoe, a technique that not even a lifetime could attain, Genichiro at last was able to reach the heights of his former master. Relentless in his assault, Genichiro now wields the power of lightning itself within his blade. Reaching his zenith, he leaps into the atmosphere, igniting his sword. As the projectile is released from his blade, the Master Shinobi meets him in the air. By doing this, he is able to absorb the element into his own body, deflecting the energy back to Genichiro. Utilizing the art of lightning reversal, Sekiro is able to turn Genichiro's strength into a grave weakness. Once again, the Lord is defeated. With the absence of his armor, we can see the corruption that lies within Genichiro's body. The rejuvenating sediment, a concentrated part of the rejuvenating waters, may have granted him impeccable resilience, but it came at a hefty price. Genichiro's goal of healing himself his grandfather, and by proxy the Ashina clan, through the power of the dragon's heritage, appears to have been unsuccessful. The immortal power would also be used to defend against the imminent invasion coordinated by the interior ministry. Ashina had fended off a siege from the ministry once before, but now few remain to defend the nation. Like reeds before a scythe, the blade of Sekiro had brought the clan to its knees. Having defeated Gaiobu, Genichiro, and the last defences of Ashina Castle, in conjunction with Ishin's illness, the wolf had inadvertently disarmed the province, leaving Genichiro with little left to defend Ashina. As indicated earlier, victims of the surgeon Dujin had red eyes, the same side effect which had manifested in Genichiro, although he was not overcome by madness. This implies that he potentially funded Dujin's research of the rejuvenating waters with the purpose of finding a way to eliminate any of its defects. In a flash of lightning, the Lord leaps from the peak of the castle, evading the claws of the wolf for now. Emma confirms that she answers to Ishin Ashina and that he had ordered her to deliver the ornamental letter to Sekiro to save Kuro from his grandson, signifying that Ishin opposes the route Genichiro had taken and understands that the power of immortality is a burden. She elaborates that Lord Genichiro's resilience to fatal blows stems from the consumption of the rejuvenating waters. Her father Dogen was once devoted to the research of its uses, but his documents on the subject and even the medicines he concocted were destroyed, potentially by the surgeon Dujin. In addition, she reveals that Kuro seeks immortal severance, to be disconnected from the lineage of the dragon's heritage, something which would result in the death of the divine heir. Sekiro can choose to aid his master in this endeavor by finding a means to end his life. In the case of granting death to an eternal being, Emma speaks of an armament known as the Mortal Blade. With this knowledge in mind, Sekiro speaks to the Divine Heir. The Immortal Oath, the Rejuvenating Waters, the Dragon Rot, they all corrupt men to the point that they no longer live as men. 
I wish to sever the chains of stagnation bred by the dragon's heritage. Wolf, will you help me achieve this aim? Kuro believes it is a fallacy to think that the gift of immortality brings glory or bliss. Its power corrupts the hearts of all men, for mortal beings are not meant to live beyond their limits. The seduction of eternal life only invites turmoil. Even if one is blessed with its power, those around them will suffer from dragon rot until their untimely deaths. And should a formidable killer on the verge of Shura attain immortality, the lives of those who walk the earth would cease to exist. The one-armed wolf finds himself in a peculiar situation. He had sworn an oath to protect the boy, yet the same master now wishes to die. On the one hand, by granting him death, he is obeying the word of his master. Conversely, eliminating the one he serves could be considered a contradiction of the Shinobi Code. Recalling the words of Al, Sekiro's duty is to obey his father first and his master second. The Shinobi was specifically instructed by Al to defend Kuro with his life. Surely abetting the Divine Heir in the pursuit of death directly undermines his father's orders. Still, Sekiro will aid Kuro. When the time comes, he will have to make a choice, to side with his master or his father. Exploring the library of the castle, Kuro finds a text regarding the ritual of immortal severance. Beyond the Fountainhead Palace, locate the sanctuary and imbibe the tears of the Holy Dragon of the Divine Realm. Here we are provided with the first ingredient required to perform the sacred rite, the tears of a holy dragon. One must journey to the Divine Realm to confront the fabled creature. Additionally, Kuro mentions a previous Divine heir by the name Takeru, who died long ago. In his final words he stated, Wrapped in the aroma of the fountainhead, I return to the Divine Realm. The passing of this heir confirms that the act of immortal severance is possible. Moreover, Kuro points to the incense burner in the room, stating that it belonged to Lord Takeru. At a later point, Kuro, in search of a means to enter the Divine Realm, discovers a note from the diary of Takeru's page. Lord Takeru held his arm over the incense burner and attempted to cut it with a sword, but incredibly, his wound healed instantly and not a drop of blood was shed. Lady Tamawe said, without it, your blood cannot be spilled. It is surmised that the blood of a divine heir is used to form the aroma required to open the way to the realm of gods. As the boy is impervious to injury, they must employ the use of the Mortal Blade, a weapon depicted in the Immortal Severance scrap. With Mortal Blade in hand, my blood may be shed. With my blood, the aroma will be complete. The Divine Realm will be in reach. Immortal Severance will be at hand. I must ask Tomoe to assist with the beheading. Finally, Kuro finds another key piece of information written by the previous divine heir, the Fragrant Flower Note. It is said that relatives of the Tomoe once gathered the Fountainhead Fragrance and arrived at the palace. You may find a key where the waters of rejuvenation converge in a deep pool, a white and deeply fragrant flower. These clues paint a picture of Tomoe and her master Takeru and how they sought the means to end the curse of immortality. A story that directly reflects the goals of Kuro and Sekiro. Retracing their journey is our best hope of replicating the ritual and fulfilling Kuro's wish. Investigating the incense burner, the one-armed wolf detects the scent of a Sakura flower. According to Lady Emma, Lord Takeru grafted the flower into the Sakura tree located at the rear of Ashina Castle and often gazed upon the branch as a reminder of his home. The flower was plucked by Lord Takeru, who took the branch from the Divine Realm as a parting relic. Over the course of time, the tree had withered and its last remaining branch was stolen by an unknown figure. The branch was once a flower, said to have been taken from this tree, the same tree in which the Divine Dragon has taken root. As mentioned earlier, Sekiro obtained a Sakura droplet from the younger version of Kuro in Hirata Estate, due to receiving the power of the dragon's heritage for a second time. 
In regards to the droplet, Kuro notes, "When the undying pledge of the dragon's heritage is broken, it's said that this remains in place of the oath. Lord Takeru's dragon blood lives on with you. Use it well." With Kuro's blessing, the sacred droplet strengthens Sekiro's ability to resurrect. Prior to departing the castle, the one-armed wolf pays a visit to Ishin, as instructed by Kuro. Discovered in his room is a handwritten letter. Dear Emma, the Ashina Castle gate has grown loud with the sound of scurrying. The Tengu will see to the rats. Worry not. Not only does the letter confirm the identity of Tengu. But it also reaffirms who Emma's true master is. He required Emma's assistance to cure his ailment. If anyone could cure him, it would be Dogen's apprentice. Regardless of his frail appearance and affliction that consumes his body, he defends his homeland, attempting to stifle the impending invasion from the Interior Ministry. Additionally, if given sake, Ishin will open up about his past. He ruminates that this land once belonged to the people of Ashina, but over time they grew weak, enabling them to be trampled into submission by external forces. As the world fell into chaos, Ishin and his soldiers found the perfect opportunity to retake control of the land. Despite the conclusion of the war, the land was far from idyllic, as it remained a place of death. He also recounts that he had killed a shura back in his heyday, a feat few could hope to accomplish. He elaborates on the topic of Tomoe and his grandson. There aren't many masters of the sword like her. To see her fight, it's like she's dancing. When you look into her eyes, you feel as if you were being drawn into the depths of the ocean. I was completely taken by her, and it almost killed me. I've lived a long life, but that was the closest I've come to death. Whether it be from her combat prowess or, to a greater degree, the allure of her gaze, Ishin struggled to overcome her. My grandson Genichiro was bewitched by the rejuvenating waters. You did well to put a stop to that for me. Unknowingly, Genichiro is on a ruinous path, acting of his own volition. The Lord views immortality as a key to protect his homeland, for he is willing to abandon his own self for his country. Unlike his grandfather, who in his youth spent his days in pursuit of life or death combat to strengthen oneself through warfare rather than relying on supernatural powers, their ideological differences had formed a schism in their relationship. In his old age, Ishin appears to be far from reticent. Revealing his innermost feelings to Sekiro. Lastly, he aids the one-armed wolf in his plight of obtaining the mortal blade to sever the ties of immortality once and for all. The mortal blade. If you had such a weapon, it may be the key to what you are after. With it, you could kill one who cannot die through normal means. The infested, I believe they are called. I have not seen one before, but it said you could stab them through the heart, or remove their head, and they wouldn't die. <laughs> If the stories are true, they'd surely be quite fearsome to kill a monster such as that. You'd need the mortal blade. I've heard it's held in Sempo Temple. However, they say the mortal blade cannot be drawn. It's just hearsay. The gates to that temple are closed now, though. Who knows what those degenerates are doing shut away up there in the mountains? There aren't any decent roads leading there. Severing immortality. That will be quite the battle. And in battle, the plans and desires of those involved churn endlessly. If you hesitate, you'll be swept away. Sekiro, hesitate, and you lose. Following his conversation with Ishin, the one-armed wolf descends to the abandoned dungeon in search of a fragment stone, which is said to be the key to reaching the divine realm. A note left behind by a rotting prisoner states, 
Supposedly, the fragrant stone is enshrined in a village in the Ashina Depths. This is as far as that old Okami tome could take me. But did they truly reach the Fountainhead Palace? The Okami clan is said to have reached the Divine Realm, but even under their guide, the prisoner failed to ascend, and instead met his end in the dungeon. This dark, cavernous place is home only to repulsive insects and accursed undead. Commanding these plagued lands is a manic individual named Dujun, the last disciple of the master surgeon Dosaku. Dosaku's influence was once prominent amongst practicing surgeons, acting as a mentor to those who sought to replicate the powers granted by the rejuvenating waters. The majority of Dosaku's apostles have since averted their gaze to the more credible practitioner Dogen, a mechanical genius who is credited with the invention of the shuriken wheel, amongst other medicinal commodities. Abandoned by his followers, Dosaku was left with naught but one devotee. A letter can be discovered which reads with a desperate inflection, Dujun, my last disciple, even if I die, the research must continue. Finish the procedure, for Ashina's sake. The procedure at hand refers to the creation of an army, a battalion of rage-filled soldiers, granted immeasurable strength through the use of the rejuvenating waters and red eyes. For what reason would Dujun be driven to build an infantry of this proportion? Long ago, the surgeon was hired by a vassal of the Ashina clan. The goal was to capture unsuspecting villagers and use them to create soldiers in preparation for the war against the ministry. The experiments proved futile, evident by the test subjects found within the abandoned dungeon. The decaying inmates are slow and withered, almost corpse-like, contrary to the enraged warriors that Dujun had hoped for. The surgeon's inability to complete the procedure was a cause of great consequence, as within the dungeon, a crumbling offering tower reads, Here lie the vassals of the Ashina clan, executed after the Great Rebellion. Although Dujun was a failure, Lord Genichiro saw potential in the botched experiments, and in turn, invited the surgeon to work anew. When the wolf happens upon the surgeon, he is seen wearing the attire of a Senpo monk, hinting at a former life at the temple. He asks for Sekiro to aid in his experiment, prompting the shinobi to capture a new test subject, preferably a strong samurai or a young large soldier, such as a member of the Taro troop. The strong samurai refers to Jinzaiman Kumano, and the member of the Taro troop alludes to Kotaro, a childlike simpleton who watches over the children of the rejuvenating waters. Kotaro is in fact the son of the rotting prisoner, who was captured by Dujun on his journey to the Divine Realm. If either of the aforementioned characters are captured, the wolf will be ordered to acquire red carp eyes. The researcher Dujun in the abandoned dungeon wants these eyes to improve his procedure. With the acquisition of the eyes, Dujun commences with his experiment on the captured prisoner. Through eavesdropping on the surgeon, signs of lunacy begin to show. He mumbles amongst himself, talking to his master Dosaku, who clearly isn't present. This frenzy worsens with time, to a point in which Dujun states, Surely you don't intend to use that on me. Very astute, my apprentice. You are the next subject. P please no! As I feared, you have strayed from the path of medicine. Why would you do such a thing? No, Master. The rejuvenating waters have bewitched you. Master, please answer me. Please answer me, Master. Why? Why would you answer me? Answer me, Dosaku! Dosaku! It is revealed that Dosaku and Dujun were the quintessential master and disciple. Often when pursuing the ideal self, one needs only look within. With that said, Dujun likely created an ideal to strive towards in the name of Dosaku, a guiding hand to lead him to greatness. In time, Dujun had lost sight of who he truly was, molding his true self with his alter ego. Whilst Dujun may have been an honest practitioner, working for the benefit of science and humanity, Dosaku explores a darker side to the character. 
harboring an obsession with his work, willing to surrender his integrity if it meant the success of an experiment. His descent into heresy explains why his disciples had abandoned him for Dogen. The surgeon, at the peak of his craze, subjects himself to his own experiment. Moving ahead to a later point, Dujon's test subject can be found on the first island past the underground waterway, harboring piercing red eyes and driven to complete madness. Alongside him stands the surgeon himself, a victim to his own insanity. The deluded soul, desperate to succeed in his mission, fated himself and his prisoner to a short life as frenzied soldiers, not to mention the many others who were sacrificed in vain. In the presence of the wolf, the hostile foes are swiftly put to rest. The surgeon's experiments had finally proven fruitful, but one must wonder, did the ends justify the means? Traversing through the dungeon leads to the bottomless hole, a large pit housing a Shichimin warrior. This is one of many seven-faced warriors who are infamous practitioners of necromancy. Interestingly, their name is likely a reference to Shichimin Misaki, a group of seven spirit-like figures within Japanese folklore who died at sea. They mainly appear surrounding streams of water and murder those who cross their path. The history of Shichimin warriors draws some parallels to the Japanese tale, as they too appear to have been killed as a consequence of water, the divine water of the palace. Upon closer inspection, a centipede is seen emerging from the body of the Shichimin, which means that they were involved in the infamous experiments conducted by the Senpo monks of Mount Congo. The monks experimented with the rejuvenating waters, hoping to recreate the powers of the divine heritage, but instead, the waters became corrupted and centipedes came to be. The parasites take control of a victim's body, reducing them to animated corpses. In death, the blessing of the water transformed the warriors into ghost-like entities. But as the gods bless the waters, so too will the confetti bless one who basks in its touch, allowing attacks to connect with apparition-type enemies. Without haste, the shinobi makes use of divine confetti and duels the warrior to the death. Progressing forward, an elevator from the bottomless hole leads to a path lined with cliffs, surrounded by sunshine and falling autumn leaves. You, yes, you. Look this way, gaze upon the image of the enlightened one. Those of the Senpo Temple have strayed from Buddha's teachings. They have abandoned their faith, seduced by a search for immortality. A mysterious voice warns of the fate that befell the devout lands of Senpo Temple. Heeding this warning, the shinobi treads carefully, encountering a man by the name of Kotaro. He is seen mourning in solitude having been abandoned by the children of the rejuvenating waters, who he was entrusted to keep watch of. Unable to locate the children, Kotaro remains confined to the outskirts of the temple, and his fate now lies within the palm of the shinobi. As mentioned previously, Kotaro could have been directed towards the abandoned dungeon, where he would become another victim of Dujun's experiments. Alternatively, Kotaro could be sent to Anayama the Peddler, Hanayama is a good man. He called me here to mourn those who died in battle. We take off the armor, cleanse the body, and make proper graves. In Kotaro's simple mind, Anayama is of pure intent, working to provide a decent burial for the poor souls who've died in battle. In reality, Anayama is an opportunistic bandit who strips trinkets of corpses, as evident by his ever-expanding inventory following Kotaro's arrival. A third option includes the acquisition of a white pinwheel and the prosthetic tool, Divine Abduction. Putting those tools to use, Sekiro gathers and releases a gust of wind, creating a large vortex which spirits Kotaro towards the Halls of Illusion. Here, he will once again be united with the children of the rejuvenating waters, only they are present in spirit alone, not in their physical form. This brings to the forefront a reality much darker than one could have imagined. 
the children never abandoned Kataro, but were instead killed in an attempt to emulate the divine heir's immortality. Although their spirit resides in the halls of illusion, the children have sadly passed away, victims of depraved experimentation. Made worse is that no one speaks of the injustice endowed upon them. Oh, it's you! I'm glad you made it! Look everyone, Mr. Shinobi is here too! Ah, oh, children, greet him properly! Hmm? Huh? Oh, right. Uh, you can't see them, can you? Maneuvering through Senpo Temple, it is evident that corruption has taken center stage. Those of the Senpo Temple mastered martial arts in the pursuit of virtue. They considered strong fists and strict discipline essential against Buddha's enemies. However, Senpo Temple was seized by an obsession for the undying, which corrupted their teachings and style. In pursuit of immortality, the monks within the temple became infested with a parasite, a centipede which inhabits their body. This act was viewed as a journey of enlightenment and was described as such. For an age, I have been blessed by the worm. To be undying is to walk the eternal path to enlightenment. Thus I must become enlightened to understand why I cannot die. It is said the holy dragon's origins were in the west. So I wonder, how did the worm come to be bestowed upon me? The monks believed that the centipede was their gateway to eternal life, not knowing that their consciousness would surrender to its corruption. The centipedes will seek out a leader, often changing names out of loyalty. Centipede chiefs are known as longarms for their large talon-like weapons. One such leader is found within the temple, standing before a chalice fueled by fire. Utilizing the grappling hook, the shinobi finds himself atop a mountain. Standing before him is a knight at the end of a fully enclosed wooden bridge. Undoubtedly, the armored warrior is an outsider, traveling from distant lands. His broad and heavy metallic armor stands out from the typical outfits worn throughout Ashina. Robert's father came from afar across seas to the south in search of the undying. Repelling a thousand blades was a small price for the blessing of rejuvenation. The warrior instantly engages with the wolf, leaving no doubt whether he is friend or foe. It is evident throughout the duel that he is driven to reach the sacred waters not for his own gain, but for his son. Robert is likely at risk of death, potentially from an injury or illness, forcing the father to track down the immortality granting waters to save his son's life. As the fight advances, the shinobi begins to alter his strategy, as his blade is unable to pierce through the dense armor plates of the opposing foe. With each clash of steel, the battle shifted towards the edge of the bridge, until an opportunity materialized and the wolf inflicted the finishing blow. In search of the divine child of rejuvenation, Sekiro enters the main hall of the temple and interrogates the master of Senpo Temple, a high Buddhist priest who mourns the loss of the many children who were sacrificed in failed experiments. The priest appears to be frail, mummified so to speak. This is a result of an ancient Buddhist practice which consists of long-term self-starvation in the hopes of abandoning all worldly pleasures to reach enlightenment and oneness with God. In the words of the priest himself, one should focus only on deeds of virtue and forego thoughts of attaining wealth. The extent of the priest's involvement in the experiments remains unclear, however, he appears filled with regret, wishing only to atone for his wrongdoings. He explains that the last remaining child is confined within the inner sanctum. That child, she's the only one. Left. She must be lonely, trapped in that room by herself. She must be so lonely. To reach the child, Sekiro interacts with the elusive hall bell and in a blink awakens to find himself in the Halls of Illusion, a maze-like structure housing the folding screen monkeys. Lost and stranded, 
The wolf looks to the illusory hall monk for answers. The monk is found meditating, unaffected by the corruption that had spread throughout Senpo Temple. Whilst others were enticed by the research for immortality, the monk valued the quiet peace within the halls of illusion. He assimilates his time at the halls to that of Nirvana, a transcendent state which represents the final goal of Buddhism, in which there is neither suffering, desire, nor sense of self. I believe you are on a mission, and wish to leave this place. Then you must defeat the monkeys depicted on the panels at the whole entrance. Once you have done so, the divine child's voice will reach you. The folding screen monkeys guarded the Hall of Illusions and befriended the divine child of rejuvenation. In preparation for the fight ahead, Sekiro learns of the monkey's strengths and weaknesses. One has enhanced eyesight, the second excellent hearing, and the third will scream to alert his companions upon detecting the shinobi's presence. The monkeys pose as a contradiction to the proverbial principle, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. The proverb expresses the lack of moral responsibility on the part of those who refuse to acknowledge impropriety. In contrast, the folding screen monkeys directly stand in judgment of those who forsook their virtues to attain immortality. Speaking of a lack of acknowledgement, a fourth invisible monkey silently follows in Sekiro's footsteps, summoning hostile spirits and inflicting terror. The invisible monkey is not mentioned by anyone, not even the illusory hall monk. He's a reference to the often forgotten fourth monkey of the original proverb, do no evil. One by one, the monkeys are struck down. Upon defeating all four, the voice of the Divine Child can be heard, the same voice which warned the shinobi at the entrance to Senpo Temple. Please, forgive them. They only sought to keep me hidden. However, it seems it was not meant to be. In the same manner that Sekiro was guided into the Halls of Illusion, he is transported out, this time awakening opposite a beautiful sanctum, surrounded by waterfalls and vegetation. Inside rests the Divine Child of Rejuvenation. Do you know of the blade that cannot be drawn? It is so called, for not one who has drawn it has ever survived. Yet you still wish to attempt this, if you are prepared. You may gaze upon the blade. <coughs> Why is it, I wonder? Are they not loath to die? The Mortal Blade is an Odachi capable of slaying the Undying. Its Crimson Blade will take the life of any who dares draw it. Without the power of resurrection, one could not hope to wield this weapon, which allows one to defeat even infested beings. Long concealed within Senpo Temple, the blade is inscribed with its true name, Gracious Gift of Tears. Through carrying the Curse of the Dragon's Heritage, Wolf is able to overcome the destructive nature of the mortal blade and wields it as its master. The Divine Child shares in Sekiro's disdain for the dragon's heritage, knowing very well the undeniable corruption that is born from it, and so she grants the shinobi her blessing to sever the ties of immortality. To do so, 
The shinobi is tasked with obtaining a particular set of items, one being a sacred passage. The transcript illustrates a method in which the corrupting powers of the divine heritage can be returned back to its origins, the West. Undying, I pray for the dragon's return. Undying, low let us wait an age for the divine heir to assimilate the cold dragon tears, for the cradle to consume the pair of serpentine fruits. Let the cradle endure, giving him shelter, granting his return to the West. The divine child agrees to become a vessel for the dragon's blood, a shepherd that would guide it far from the East. The transcript remarks that the cradle must consume a pair of serpentine fruits. This refers to both the dried and fresh serpent viscera, which are hearts of great serpents, located deep within the sunken valley. The great serpent is considered to be a god of the land, and the heart is believed to be where one spirit resides. Apparently, denizens of the sunken valley worship the organs, believing they represent the deity itself. Going a step further, according to denizens of the sunken valley, such places are appropriate for offering oneself in marriage to the great serpent. If one wishes to become a bride, they must enter the belly of the serpent in the valley. Spoken plainly, the denizens' devotion was so great that they offered themselves to be eaten by the serpent. The final key item to be retrieved is the Lotus of the Palace, a white lotus flower found blooming in the depths of the sunken valley, where the fountainhead waters pool deeply. Without question, the one-armed wolf begins his journey to the sunken valley, home to great serpents and its worshippers, the sunken valley clan. Members of the clan will shoot any stranger who approaches, and Snake Eye's guns are particularly feared. This elite group of women are descendants of the ancient Okami clan. Their especially sharp eyes allow them to snipe victims at great range. The Snake Eyes stand as guards of the valley, patrolling the top and bottom entrance to the gunfort. These vigorous beings have few weaknesses, with the exception being the Sabimaru prosthetic tool. Wielded in wars of old, the blade's blue rust was used to drive off inhuman Okami warrior women. Even now, it is likely to be effective against their descendants. Moving ahead, the dried serpent viscera is found displayed in a shrine, guarded by a great serpent. This demonstrates the denizens' admiration for the organ, placing it at an altar for all to worship. The retrieval of the fresh serpent viscera is problematic, however, as the heart still beats within the colossal body of a living serpent, the same one encountered in the Ashina outskirts. The serpent now rests beyond the sunken valley cavern. To reach it, the wolf must utilize his puppeteer ninjutsu to take control of an assassin guarding kite machinery. The puppet moves on behalf of its master, and so the assassin is made to fly the kite at a higher elevation, allowing Sekiro to grapple his way to the cavern. In carving this path, the Black Hat Badger is also able to travel to the Sunken Valley Cavern, but what business would he have in such a place? This? <laughs> it's, uh... It belongs to my kid. After the little run passed away, all the grunt work I used to do just didn't cut it. Experiments with rejuvenation, kidnapping, responsibilities of a black hat, everything to do with this temple was just rubbing me the wrong way. Now, at the Sunken Valley Passage, the wolf edges towards the end of a wooden plank, extruding from a cliff. Directly below lies the mighty great serpent, twirled around the face of a rock, Without hesitation, the shinobi plunges towards the beast, building up momentum as he descends through the air. With the wind at his back, the wolf measures his blade in anticipation. Aware of the narrow window for success, his execution is timed to perfection, piercing the coarse skin of the serpent upon impact. The creature cries out in agony as its blood sprays the skies like rain falling from above. The final death blow removes all doubt, hurling the beast towards the ground, leaving it in a pile of its own blood. Whilst the Okami worshipped the dragon deity, their descendants idealized its opposite, the Great Serpent. 
Although not a centipede, the serpent portrays the role of an omakade, which in Japanese folklore is a giant centipede that wraps itself around a mountain and is slain by a warrior who is rewarded with an endless supply of rice. This mirrors the journey of Sekiro, who slays the great serpent by orders of the divine child, who acts as an infinite source of rice. The idea that the serpent is emblematic of a giant centipede solidifies a symbolic distinction between the dragon and the serpent. With both hearts obtained, all that remains is the lotus of the palace, preserved by the guardian ape. The ape resides in a shallow pond, overlooked by a giant statue, keeping a watchful eye on the lotus flower. Its aroma is known to attract female apes, and so the lonely guardian tends to it, awaiting the arrival of a potential companion. The ape appears to have survived fatal wounds from a previous battle, evidenced by a katana stuck through its neck, in addition to various slashes of a blade drawn across its face. In defense of its domain, the ape rages on, charging at the shinobi with intent to kill. Using his grapple hook, along with a variety of prosthetic tools, Sekiro is able to dictate the battle, slowly wearing down his foe and concluding the fight by decapitating the ape with the very sword cemented in its neck. In a shocking turn, the headless ape stands tall once more. This affirms that the ape had been corrupted by a centipede, granting it immortality. To put the beast to rest, the shinobi uses his blade as a wedge, drawing out the parasite from the guardian ape's body. Through a lapse in judgment, Sekiro does not utilize his mortal blade to rid the world of the centipede for good. The ape was defeated, though its roar can still be heard. Following the battle, a slender finger of a young woman can be retrieved. There is a shinobi technique called the finger whistle that can drive beasts wild. The one who used it before clearly used it for this purpose, as evidenced by the finger's open hole. The slender finger, along with the katana found plunged into the neck of the ape, suggests that Sekiro was not the first shinobi to roam the vertical lands of the Sunken Valley. I trained in the techniques of the shinobi in the valley where the monkeys dwelled. There were two of us. We were rogue shinobi. There was no proper master for the likes of us. That's why we went to the valley. To run, to jump, to clash swords, where one slip would mean your doom. That was how we trained. We came to move exactly as monkeys did after a time. The sculptor was known as the Bounden Monkey of the Sunken Valley, whilst his partner was referred to as Kingfisher. Following a brutal confrontation with the Guardian Ape, the Kingfisher lost her life to the beast. The Kingfisher's cry could be heard along the waterfront of the Sunken Valley. Now she cries no more. The headless guardian ape was a colossal beast, plagued with the power of the undying, and through those means, the eternal beast lives on, only now with the partner it had long awaited. In the presence of the wolf and the use of the mortal blade, those days are short-lived. Having dealt with the guardian ape, the Lotus of the Palace is acquired. Moving forward, Sekiro heads into a mystical forest, shrouded by a thick coating of fog. A dying Buddhist is found slumped against a golden statue. He warns of the one who opposes Buddha, pleading for Sekiro to slay him. The one of whom I speak hides in an abandoned temple up ahead. He sealed away the village in a shadowy fog so that he can fool the villagers. The mist encountered throughout the forest is manufactured by none other than the Mist Noble, a formidable creature who resides in an isolated temple. Through practicing his flute, the Noble unleashes a spell that conceals the path to Mibu village, keeping travelers from discovering the depraved practices that come to pass. In defeating the Noble, the illusion is dispelled making way for the discoveries that lie ahead. Mibu means aquatic life, or life born of the water, which perfectly summarizes the events that occurred within Mibu village. It all began with the head priest, 
who was obsessed with the divine waters and wished only to be accepted as a humble servant to the Fountainhead Palace. He encouraged the denizens of the village to imbibe his Dragon Spring Sake, believing that it will lead to them being accepted as citizens of the palace. Consuming the sake instilled an insatiable thirst within the villagers, one that could not be quenched. The supply of sake was running thin, and with little options remaining, the people searched for alternatives. The sake cask runs dry in no time, so everyone has no choice but to drink the water in the ponds and rivers. But the more you drink it, the thirstier you get. Oh, you get thirstier and thirstier, can't ever drink enough. This is basket wearer Shosuke who covers his head with a large basket to avoid the villagers who have lost their sanity. The stream of water flows from Fountainhead, which reveals that the citizens were unknowingly drinking the divine waters. Through excessive consumption, they began to mutate, transforming into fish-like creatures. Shosuke, although cautious not to succumb to the thirst, will in time join the villagers in their madness. I couldn't resist and drink it all! Throughout the village, shedded snakeskin coats much of the environment, suggesting that a great serpent once roamed these lands. Other ritualistic practices can also be cited, such as masses of slugs being placed on planks of wood covered in blood. The reason for such proceedings remains unclear, but the mind can only wonder. Prior to the sickness that had spread throughout the village, black pine trees were prevalent within the forest and would possess an ever smouldering flame which acted as a landmark to find one's way through the village. As the villagers began losing their mind, they developed a newfound fear. In time, the villagers came to loathe the flames and the black pines were lost. Those who defended the flames were equally loathed. In exploring the village, the head priest is found hoarding barrels of sake, still intent on ascending the palace and imbibing its sweet nectar. His cup appears to have run dry and the essence of panic begins to seep through. If granted the water of the palace, the head priest will mutate into a palace noble, a creature of little humanity, a fitting end for the one responsible for the downfall of the village. Further ahead stands Jinzaiman Komano, that is if he hadn't previously been sent to the abandoned dungeon. Charmed by the sweet melody of a shamisen player, he is lured into Mibu village. I finally saw her. The shamisen player was a woman. I only saw her from afar, but I could tell. A beautiful, yet fleeting presence. The woman he speaks of is Orin of the Water, Isolated and alone, she mourns the loss of her beloved Lord Sakuza. In his absence, she practices her shamisen, creating enchanting music in the hopes of inviting him back to her. No matter how many letters I send, he never writes me back, and no one will tell me where he is. Actually, sir, can you tell me? Where is Lord Sakuza? In not knowing, Sekiro is labelled a liar, and as a result, Orin becomes hostile. She is as graceful a fighter as she is a musician, dancing through the field with her blade swinging with ill intent. Although formidable, she is no match for the shinobi wolf, and in consequence, Orin of the water is put to rest. You brought the shamisen player to me just a moment ago. She caressed me while playing her sweet melody. It was a different song than before, like a lullaby, a peaceful, warm melody. At this point, Sekiro is granted a Junza's Jizo statue, which reads, to enswathe a Jizo statue is to express feelings of parental love. Lord Sakuza, please take this cloth and use it to bundle this little one, so that he may live on in peace. Drawn from this information is that Lord Sakuza had wrapped his son with a light pink cloth to express his parental love. 
The same cloth is seen worn as a cape on Jin Zyman's torso. That, coupled with the fact that the name Jizo is likely a shortened version of Jin Zyman, suggests that he is potentially Lord Sakuza's son and Orin of the Water is his mother. The history of Lord Sakuza's disappearance remains a mystery and so does the reason for Orin appearing as a phantom. She likely passed away during Jin Zyman's youth, which explains his inability to identify his mother, but even then, fate drew them closer together. Earlier on, Jin Zyman mentioned that his father told him stories of Mibu village and warned him not to go to the ominous town. This suggests that Lord Sakuza hadn't gone missing, but is intentionally avoiding Orin. The story of the Sharmazan player draws some parallels to a Japanese tale as old as time. It's a tale of a samurai who from a distance hears the most beautiful singing voice that he had ever heard. He expects that a voice this attractive must be attached to an equally attractive body. The samurai follows the sound of the voice until finally reaching the woman responsible for the delightful harmonies. Under the darkness of night, they make love However, the following morning, he comes to the realization that the woman's physical appearance does not match her voice and devises a plan to dispose of her. He invites her to walk with him up a mountain road. Filled with joy and believing that she had at last found love, she accepts. Without warning, the samurai pushes her into a ravine, killing the woman in the process. Lord Sakuza may have played the role of the samurai in the tale, he was potentially lured by the sound of Orin's Sharmazan, but in time may have caused her death to escape her. This would explain her apparition-like form. Comparable to the old tale, Orin was potentially drowned in a ravine, granting her the fitting name, Orin of the Water. Having experienced such betrayal, she now conceals her face to mask her appearance. The final challenge that stands between Sekiro and the Fountainhead Palace is the Corrupted Monk, an illusion of a far greater foe. The monk watches over the cave entrance, which leads to the palace, stopping the village water dwellers from reaching the sacred lands. Sekiro defeats the Corrupted Monk and in turn acquires an item of great importance. Those who seek to join the procession must master the Mibu breathing technique Without it, the Divine Dragon cannot be met. Sekiro enters an ominous cave, with a spotlight guiding his attention to a marital shrine. Surrounding the environment are a plethora of shelter stones, which appear in the bodies of those who have long drank from the Fountainhead waters. This stone is often referred to as a fragment stone, and is mentioned in the Rotting Prisoner's Note as one of the ingredients required to reach the Fountainhead Palace. In possession of the Shelter Stone, the Lotus of the Palace, and the Mortal Blade, Sekiro is prepared to return to Ashina Castle and craft the Fountainhead Incense that would pave the way to the Divine Realm. The Shinobi, now in arm's reach of the Fountainhead Palace, is prepared to face the source of Ashina's long-reigning conflict and sever the ties of immortality. To peer into the eyes of a Divine Dragon and not quiver under a mountain of doubt, is insurmountable to most, but not the one-armed wolf, whose entire journey has prepared him for this one moment. On returning to the castle, the shinobi is caught in the crossfire of a conflict between the Interior Ministry and the Ashina clan, it is clear that the invasion was unexpected as the ill-prepared Ashina soldiers are seen fleeing the battle and cowering in fear. Red Guard soldiers were dispatched by the central forces to overthrow Ishin and take control of the land. The Ashina clan is unable to fend off the intruders as the interior ministry proves much more technologically advanced, employing the use of firearms in their arsenal of weapons. Desperate times weigh heavily upon the Ashina clan, as their supply of salt runs thin, resulting in wounds going untreated and soldiers falling ill. 
the wolf leaps across the rooftops of the castle, navigating his way towards the residence of the divine heir and Emma, worried that they would be targeted by the ministry. This task is not made easy, as the interior ministry's most trusted agents patrol the rooftops, the lone shadows. Upon surviving the onslaught of the intruders, the wolf arrives at the peak of Ashina Castle and finds himself staring in the eyes of a ghost of his past. Seduced by the dragon's heritage, Owl wishes to usurp the dragon's blood for himself to achieve the much desired state of immortality. Presented with an ultimatum, Sekiro's loyalty is put to the test. Does he forsake his master and uphold the Iron Code, which in the eyes of Shinobi is absolute? Or does he break the Iron Code and stand opposing his own father? It is here where the wolf must pledge his fealty. In siding with Owl, Emma is compelled to unsheathe her blade and clash swords with he who she once considered an ally. In protection of the divine heir, Emma, the gentle blade, steps forward into battle. Trained by Lord Ishin himself, she wields her sword with finesse, but even then, she never had the slightest desire to take a life, at least not that of a human. Emma's interest in the art of the sword was strictly for the purpose of slaying a demon, a Shora. The term Shora refers to a path of carnage and destruction that awaits those who forsake their humanity in pursuit of power, immortality, fame or fortune. Emma has witnessed these tendencies of violence once before and is afraid that Sekiro is too far gone on the path of becoming a Shora. A demon's thirst is quenched only with blood and so without remorse, the wolf impales Emma through the throat sending her lifeless corpse hurling towards the ground. Stepping to the forefront, Ishin Ashina stands unfazed by the wolf. He is a true master of the sword, no less so in his veil of years. Ishin was prosperous in preventing the emergence of Ishura once before and attempts to do so again. Regrettably, in his later years, Ishin is no match for the blood drunk Shinobi and is killed in battle leaving the Divine Heir defenseless. Sekiro, it was not to be. Following the climax of the battle, Owl makes his return with a black mortal blade clasped in his right hand and Genichiro's severed head in his left, revealing that while Sekiro was in the midst of battle, Owl killed Genichiro and claimed a second mortal blade for himself. No, nothing stands in our way. Ashina, ah, the interior ministers, the whole country is ours for the taking. I, the Kanzai Sekiro, the Honourable Shinobi, exists no more. In his place, a Shura is born, a mighty force to be reckoned with, a demon sculpted out of hatred and violence. Set ablaze, the Shura takes his final form, and no being is exempt from his wrath. The fires of war rage on once more. Soldiers and townfolk alike died by the thousands. Very few survived. Ashina became the setting for the most tragic massacre of the Sengoku era. And for a long time after, it was said a demon lurked the land. One singular choice led to this tragic end, the choice to obey the Iron Code. Alternatively, if the Shinobi chooses to remain loyal to his master and break the Iron Code, the Great Shinobi Owl confronts the wolf, and a duel transpires between the master and the student. Although evenly matched, the wolf's conviction guides him beyond his physical boundaries. The battle comes to a stop with the flawless execution of the death of a shadow, a signature technique taught by Owl himself. Using his opponent for leverage, 
the wolf leaps up in the air, rotating his body as to land facing his adversary's back. As the opportunity presents itself, Sekiro focuses his soul on the release of the blade, tearing through the great owl's flesh and putting him to rest once and for all. In spite of losing, the owl could not resist being proud of his student, muttering the words, that's my boy, as a final breath exhales from his body. Unexpectedly, an aromatic branch is found on the corpse of the great shinobi owl, revealing that all along, it was him who stole the branch from the sakura tree as a means to prevent the immortal severance ritual from taking place. The flower is capable of purification to sever the shackles that bind the immortal bearer of the dragon's blood. With the flower in his possession, Owl intended to usurp the power of the divine heritage from Kuro, and he would have succeeded if not for the wolf. The pursuit of immortality has caused countless people to forsake their humanity. Even the great Owl, who was trusted to uphold the duty of protecting Lord Kuro, this is exactly why the strand that binds immortality must be severed from its very root. Atop Ashina Castle, Emma discovers Tomoe's note, which reads, Lord Takuro's coughs are worsening still. Returning to the divine realm is hopeless, and I wish only to sever the dragon's heritage and restore his humanity. Restoration requires the Everblossom and Mortal Blade, and yet I cannot acquire the latter. It was hidden by the high priest of Senpo Temple, who has no desire to sever the immortal ties. From the note, we can infer that Lord Takaru had fallen ill, and Tomoe sought a means of restoring his humanity. She discovered that the ties of the dragon's blood can be cut, transforming its owner into a regular human. Those made immortal by the oath of the dragon's heritage shackle their masters, meaning that for purification to occur, the oath bound of the dragon's heritage must die. Beneath the branches of the Everblossom tree, Lady Tamoe attempted to end her own life, to free Takaru from the dragon's heritage, but she was unsuccessful as she did not wield the mortal blade. This information encompasses great implications, as whilst previously it was thought that Lord Kuro must die to attain immortal severance, it is now revealed that Sekiro can make the choice of sacrificing himself to free Kuro. With the mortal blade in his possession, the wolf may be able to achieve what Lady Tomoe could not. The aromatic branch was once a flower, but without the ever blossom petals, the branch is worthless. In light of this knowledge, Emma pays a visit to the graves of Lord Takaru and Tomoe in the hopes of better remembering a time when the Everblossom existed. She stands in thought, pondering on what can be done to obtain the Everblossom, but alas, nothing comes to mind. Or at least that's the notion she displays. Upon eavesdropping on a conversation between Emma and the sculptor, it is revealed that purification is still feasible by utilizing the Father's Bell charm, which is found on Owl's body following his death. The Owl held this bell for a long time. Offering it at the dilapidated temple may result in seeing a different memory than before. If the Ever Blossom cannot be attained in the present, one can only hope the past can prove more generous. In presenting the bell, Wolf once again visits the memory of Hirata Estate, where he was killed by an unnamed assassin. Things are different this time around, as a lone shadow recognizes the wolf and even remarks that he's supposed to be dead. This indicates that Sekiro isn't simply reliving a past memory, but in fact infiltrating the memory and rewriting history every step of the way. Inside the arena where Wolf fought Lady Butterfly, Owl is found. He was supposedly on the cusp of death in the previous memory, but here he is, standing tall, a master shinobi in his prime. Owl, from the very beginning, was pulling the strings, orchestrating the invasion of Harata Estate, and later Ashina Castle, using the Ministry as puppets, as a means of capturing the Divine Heir. It was Owl who stabbed Sekiro through the back, leaving him for dead three years ago, all in pursuit of the Dragon's heritage. Mirroring the rooftop battle, Sekiro is forced to defeat his own father. 
putting an end to all of his scheming and betrayal. From his body, the aromatic flower can be obtained, the same flower which had later become an empty branch. In this old memory, the ever blossom still bloomed, and thus purification is made possible. To create the fountainhead incense, which is a vital concoction needed to access the divine realm, Sekiro places the lotus flower, shelter stone, and ever blossom into an incense burner, in addition to a droplet of blood from the divine air drawn by the mortal blade. With the ritual complete, Wolf infuses his clothes with the aroma emanating from the incense burner. Before embarking on his final journey, Sekiro pays a visit to the divine child of rejuvenation. Staying true to his word, he presents the child with the two serpent viscera acquired in the sunken valley, allowing her to become a cradle that returns the divine dragon home. It appears I have succeeded in becoming the cradle. My tears, they freeze as they flow down my face. These frozen tears, take them. The divine air must drink them together with the dragon tears of the divine realm. The wolf sets off on his final pilgrimage to retrieve the dragon tears from the divine realm. He returns to the cave which housed the sweetly scented bridal offering and steps into the shrine. Laying down his mortal blade, the wolf rests. In a moment of serenity, the hand of a colossal being reaches down and carries the shrine above the surface. Towering above the entire landscape, a rope-threaded being steps into the fray, a being so enormous that mountains appear miniature in its presence. The entity bears a strong resemblance to a Shimanawa, a Shinto purification rope, that is placed near sacred objects with the goal of warding off evil spirits. The entity is likely placed on the outskirts of the palace to maintain its purity, ensuring that only those who belonged within the divine realm can set foot in it. Bathed in the aroma of the ever blossom, the wolf is welcomed to the Fountainhead Palace. Upon arrival, he is challenged by the true monk, a Naginata wielding guardian of the Vermilion Bridge. The monk is a former priestess who had become corrupted by a centipede. She dons the mask of a fierce guardian deity, which suggests that her role is to guard the palace from potential evil. Enticed by the concept of immortality, the monk likely meddled with the divine waters and became infested by a centipede. The shinobi had previously faced the illusion of this foe in Mibu village and through the experience gained, is able to take down the true monk. Advancing ahead, the Fountainhead Palace unveils itself. Giant cherry blossom trees overlook the landscape. Vibrant blue skies look down from above, and true to its reputation, the flow of water is truly eternal. This small part of Ashina is exceedingly old. The ancient soil, rocks, and water that pervaded the land are said to have attracted the attention of gods. One such god was the Divine Dragon, who migrated from the west. Populating the environment is the Akami clan, a class of warrior women who exist in servitude of the divine dragon. Affirming this notion is the name Okami, which refers to a dragon deity of water. Whilst the Akami clan sought the divine realm, their descendants chose the great serpent as their god, opting to inhabit the sunken valley instead. The Okami warriors are observed dancing throughout the palace a ritual performed as an offering for the dragon. Mysteriously, this practice left them brimming with vigor. The leader of the Akami clan, Shizu, perches upon a branch of a great sakura tree. She leaps into the air, performing a powerful kick, which hurls a lightning ball towards the shinobi. Although powerful from afar, once the distance is closed, a flurry of attacks leaves the warrior defenseless. Throughout Fountainhead, palace nobles roam in large numbers. These are residents who had been mutated by the divine water, which at this point has flooded the bulk of the land. The palace nobles have a craving for the vitality of youth. They can't help themselves. They want nothing but to sap away more and more of it. An old palace maid explains that since becoming a noble, her father was entranced by a great carp, bewitched by it. Now he lives only to serve it, an eternal slave to its desires. Although the father is beyond saving, 
he may still be granted peace through death, a fate preferable to his current predicament. The great carp emerges upon the ringing of a particular bell, anticipating the arrival of its next meal. In acquiring the truly precious bait and offering it earnestly to the great carp, Sekiro is able to deceive the creature into consuming a tainted substance. The carp is later found laying lifeless at the bottom of the sunken valley, and from its body, a great white whisker is extracted. The sound of the whisker being removed is surely magic to the ears of certain people. Some would feel relief at the sound of their mission being completed, others the joy of having their heart's desire granted. Gifting the whisker to the maid's father grants him his desire of being freed from the shackle of the carp. Returning at a later point, the father is found dead next to the bell and his daughter by his side. Although not in an ideal manner, closure is provided to the carp attendant and his daughter. This may be enough for some, however, there was a second daughter, one who took initiative, seeking revenge of her own. Located on the palace grounds, the old maid states the following. The gates to the palace have been closed for a long time now. I have a very important task I must tend to. Might you open the door to the palace, young man? By opening the door she speaks of, Sekiro unknowingly contributes to the massacre of numerous palace nobles. You... you beasts. You tricked him all this time. Nobility this and eternity that. Pretty lies to fool him. Give him back. Father, my father, give him back. The old maid took matters into her own hands, finding peace in killing those who were responsible for her father's death. There are consequences to such actions, as some believe that you inherit the karma of those you've killed. The Sakura Bull of the palace is theorized to have been burdened with the karma of man, likely of those it had devoured. Upon defeating the bull, the number of spirit emblems that can be held is increased, suggesting that Sekiro had inherited the beast's karma. Moving ahead, Sekiro approaches a small cave covered in green vegetation and knee-high water. A bluish hue guides the shinobi through the dimly lit cavern, directing them towards an altar. A deceased woman dressed in white and gold kneels before the shrine, which prompts Sekiro to initiate a prayer. In the blink of an eye, he awakens in a void, an empty space with a towering but brittle ever-blossom tree, long decomposed, the divine realm at last. From the ground, all dragons of the tree begin to sprout, ancient sickly creatures who worship the divine dragon. They play their flutes to appease the deity and fight to protect the divine realm from intruders. Using the old magic of the Everblossom, they summon roots and spit poison. Although great in numbers, the old dragons are evidently weak, unable to guard the realm effectively. In the midst of battle, the wind begins to pick up, the ground shakes, and the presence of a far greater threat is felt. The fighting comes to a halt, and what remains of the old dragons turn to the Sakura tree, now blossoming with bright purple petals coating its outer layer. In time with a lightning strike, a gust of wind blinds the arena, followed by nothing but silence. The shinobi averts his gaze for a moment, and upon looking back, the divine dragon stands before him, a serpentine creature, titanic in size and molded into the great tree. The Divine Dragon wields a seven-branched sword, held only by royalty. Reflecting Sekiro, the dragon's left arm is severed. Could this be connected to the severed branch of the Sakura tree, retrieved by Lord Takaru? The Divine Dragon unleashes its wrath, juggling both lightning and its mighty blade. Utilizing his grapple hook, the shinobi escapes incoming attacks and patiently waits an opportunity to strike back. The dragon begins to summon lightning strikes from the sky, which for any other recipient is a point of surrender. Using the reversal technique, Sekiro carries the force of lightning in his blade, 
Soaring through the air, he unleashes a bolt of lightning, concentrated towards the divine dragon. With every point of contact, the dragon cries in anguish, until the final blow sends it crashing down. The dragon's eye is pierced with the mortal blade, and from within, a tear falls into the palm of the wolf. The gracious gift of tears can only be granted by the mortal blade. The body of the divine dragon is eternal, and its tears, once shed, will maintain their form and moisture in perpetuity. Should one of the dragon's heritage partake of the dragon's tears, immortal severance will be reified. The journey now complete, Sekiro returns to Ashina Castle, only to find that in his absence, Lord Ishan had succumbed to his illness and passed away. The central forces seized this opportunity to double down on their invasion, striking whilst the iron was hot. Emma is found kneeled beside Ishan's corpse. With little hope of reclaiming the castle, she grants Sekiro a secret passage key, which can be used to escape the province. Kuro has escaped the castle through this passage, and the wolf looks to join him there. The invasion of Ashina has led to much bloodshed, with innocent lives being taken as collateral. The Black Hat Badger is found incapacitated, with his back to a tree, on the brink of death. I couldn't take it. Too many rats swarming in out of the woodwork. Ishin must have terrified him, that's why. I'd gone and done something a little out of character. Those mangy rats, they were closing in on a little kid. <laughs> so, so I saved him. And now look at me. I guess the great Black Hat Badger story ends here. As a father who's had to bury his own son, the Black Hat Badger knows the pain of losing a child all too well, prompting him to intervene when he witnessed a child being attacked. He gave his own life to see another flourish, yet in the grand scheme of war, his valiant actions go unnoticed, an unsung hero of Ashina. Anayama the Peddler, having had all of his stock pillaged by the invaders, is left in a pool of his own blood, Still drawing breath, he gives the wolf a promissory note, allowing him to purchase items at a discounted rate, a last act of goodwill before his passing. Hanbei the Undying resides still on the outskirts of Ashina, carrying the curse of immortality through a centipede. Having claimed the mortal blade, Hanbei asks a favor from the wolf to cut him down and remove the centipede from his body to die with his honor intact and be freed from his sins. The wolf obliges and frees Hanbei from the false life that had been forced upon him. With war on the horizon, the state of Ashina worsens by the minute. A prophecy foretells of a much larger threat that's to come. The dead will rise as mountains and the hate will flow like an inferno. It will give birth to a demon. The Shura storyteller speaks of a man who had failed to become a Shura, but instead became a vessel for the flames of hatred, a one-armed demon prowling the battlefield, consumed by the wrath of his deepest resentment. Upon slaying the demon of hatred, the creature speaks in a familiar voice, thanking the wolf for freeing them. The storyteller remarks, You know, don't you? You know who the one-armed demon was before. The demon of hatred was indeed Orangutan, the sculptor. This may come as a surprise, but the signs were there all along. Are the flames still burning? Emma, the answer to that isn't going to change. I could carve Buddha idols for all eternity, and the flames of hatred would still rage on. Although the sculptor retired the shinobi prosthetic, it was too late. He had already gone too far, killing too many. The flames of hatred had already begun to manifest. For years, he had suppressed the flames within his soul, hoping that they would not surface. But in his heart, he knew the day would eventually come. As fate would have it, he was bound stubbornly to this world, 
It wasn't until he became a demon that he was finally able to depart for the next. The wolf leaves Ashina using the secret passage and meets Kuro at the reservoir. Bleeding from his chest, the divine heir stands before Genichiro, who reveals that he had acquired a second mortal blade. In addition to the red mortal blade, there exists one that is black in color. The blade's name is Open Gate and is said to hold the power to open a gate to the underworld. Kuro warns that one cannot change Ashina's fate with such a weapon and the dragon's heritage is no one's right to bear. At this stage, Genichiro is beyond reasoning and the wolf is compelled to draw his sword. In the same field where it all began, the fight for immortality must come to an end. One man fights for the glory of his clan, the other to rid the world of the plague of the dragon's heritage, both believing in their cause to the absolute. Even with a mortal blade, Genichiro is still no match for the one-armed wolf. Time and time again, he is defeated. In the end, he was powerless, and he knew that, but his final desire can yet live on, if not through him, then be it through his grandfather. Using the mortal blade, Genichiro buries his sword into his own shoulder, opening a gateway to the underworld and giving life to Ishin, one who returns from the great beyond, does so at the peak of their prosperity. From the corpse of his grandson, Ishin, the sword saint, emerges, a warrior in his prime. Pitiful grandchild, this was your last wish. See Ashina returned from the great beyond. Which means Sekiro. I must destroy you. At his peak, Ishin Ashina devoted himself to deadly conflict in pursuit of strength a single-minded killing machine of a man. Ishin's endurance is endless and his aggression relentless. The sword saint flows through the field like a petal in the wind, striking from every angle all at once. His sword bends to his will, never missing his target or wasting an opportunity. One mistake could see the end of the wolf, but his shinobi's eyes do not follow the blade without anticipating its movements. Remaining composed even when fearful of its sharp edge is the key to victory. Ringing in the mind of the shinobi, the echoes of Ishin's adage calls to him. Hesitation is defeat. Sekiro rises to the occasion. With every strike deflected, he retaliates with two. As the fight progresses, Ishin kneels to the earth and brings forth the mighty spear of General Tamura, diversifying his arsenal of weapons. The spear, coupled with a repeating pistol, is almost unbearable for most to handle. Lightning begins to permeate the arena, as the sword saint commands it with every purposeful swing of his spear. The wolf remains composed, as life or death struggle is what defines a shinobi. He inverses Ishin's most powerful weapon, guiding incoming lightning back to the sword saint. At the climax of the duel, the wolf calms his body and mind through breathing before inflicting the final blow, piercing Ashina's most skilled combatant through the heart. In death, the Sword Saint acknowledges Sekiro's artistry, praising him in his final moments. Well, Done, Sekiro. In truth, Ishin never wanted to fight the wolf. He was given no choice but to fulfill his grandson's last wish. Even then, he came short. In light of his death, the dragon's heritage can finally be addressed, be it through immortal severance, purification, or cradling the divine dragon back to its origins. The fate of Ashina yields before the one-armed wolf, 
A man who was once considered a stray dog, now burdened with the responsibility of shaping the future. To achieve immortal severance, Sekiro must grant Lord Kuro the dragon's tears, followed by taking his life with the mortal blade. Reluctantly, he holds his sword in position. Knowing what must be done, he pauses for a moment. Every fiber in his body restrains him from taking the next step. To comfort his sworn shinobi, Kuro clasps the sharp end of the blade in his palm. His blooded hand guides the sword towards his own chest, giving Wolf no choice but to follow through. At the break of dawn, the mortal blade is driven through the body of the divine heir, and the ties of immortality are severed. As for the fate of the one-armed wolf, he inherits the role of the sculptor and spends his remaining days at the dilapidated temple, carving Buddha to atone for his sins. A final gift from Emma sees Sekiro reunited with his prosthetic arm, which he had abandoned following the events at the reservoir. At his lowest moment, Sekiro was taken under the sculptor's wing for guidance. Now, he is the mentor that guides future shinobis through their moments of despair. No doubt a day will come when a shinobi arrives seeking strength. An alternate path, if chosen, would result in the divine heir retaining his life. As through purification, Sekiro is able to sacrifice himself in his stead. As mentioned previously, those made immortal by the oath of the dragon's heritage shackle their masters, meaning that for purification to occur, the oath band of the dragon's heritage must die. Lady Tomoe sought this procedure to free Lord Takeru, but was unsuccessful as she did not wield the mortal blade. To purify Kuro, Wolf imparts the Divine Dragon's Tears, in addition to the aromatic flower obtained in the old memory. He unsheaves his mortal blade and stares into the red aroma emanating from within. Presenting himself as the ultimate sacrifice, Sekiro wishes to see his master live on and embrace what it means to be human. Condemning the last immortal, Wolf takes his own life, shattering the immortal oath once and for all. With the passage of time, Lord Kuro and Emma rest at the wolf's grave, mourning his absence and indebted to his sacrifice. Kuro pledges to leave Ashina and venture out into the world. He promises to cherish and live for every moment without looking back. This is his way of ensuring that Sekiro's sacrifice was not in vain. Be it through immortal severance or purification, Kuro is free from the curse of the dragon's heritage, but that does not rid Ashina of its power entirely. The divine heir was once Takaru, followed by Kuro. Who's to say another won't take his place? A final decision sees the return of the divine dragon to its place of origin, liberating Ashina from its influence. Following the duel with the sword saint, Sekiro carries the divine heir away from the reservoir taking him to the Divine Child of Rejuvenation. Utilizing the frozen tears crafted from the Serpent Viscera, the cradling ritual is made possible. The Divine Child agrees to become a cradle for both the Divine Heir and the Dragon's blood within him. Rather than severing Kuro's connection to immortality, the Divine Child acts as a vessel that shepherds the Dragon's heritage back to its origins in the West. Kuro rests within the Divine Child's heart, who prepares for her departure. Their journey to sever the ties with fate will be long and arduous, yet they do not travel alone. The Shinobi of the Dragon stands ready to confront any obstacle they may encounter, acting as a guardian for the Divine Child and Kuro. With the rising sun, they depart to the west, to the birthplace of the Divine Dragon. The Dragon's heritage was set free from its homeland and drifted to Japan, choosing to settle in an exceedingly old part of Ashina. Its power was never intended for this land, yet for its acquisition, men waged war and blood was drawn. 
The power came at a price, as the life force used to revive fallen warriors was taken from the innocent, causing dragon rot to spread throughout Ashina. Blinded by the presence of immortality, the repercussions were neglected, and many suffered as a result. Peace was not an option. Various clans fought for the dragon's heritage, believing that in possessing it, their family lineage would live on for eternity, creating an endless cycle of violence, becoming pawns to their own ambition. The waters of the Fountainhead Palace, blessed by the Divine Dragon, also came to be a great cause of contention. Whilst water is often regarded as an element of purification, in its stagnant form, it becomes a cause of disease and illness. The obsession to ascend the divine realm led to entire villages falling victim to the tainted substance. Residents imbibed the water like gluttons and were mutated into fish-like creatures, and those who hadn't yet transformed were eventually led down the same inevitable path. For the monks of Sempo Temple, to be undying is to walk the eternal path to enlightenment, and so they sought to replicate the immortality-granting powers of the dragon's heritage, sacrificing the innocent lives of many children in the process. Genitro sacrificed himself in pursuit of immortality to protect his province, whereas in direct contrast, the Senpo monks sacrificed others for self-preservation. Through experiments conducted with the divine waters, centipedes were granted life. In a way, those who were infested with a centipede became immortal. But at what cost? Their bodies may have lived on, but their consciousness was long gone. In Japanese mythology, centipedes are among the only things that dragons fear. They represent the power and ferocity that even the smallest of creatures can embody. The divine dragon is not inherently evil, but it was the actions of humans that gave rise to corruption. Accepting this idea, we can infer that the centipedes act as an evil counterpart to the divine dragon, born from the greed of man. Whilst the dragon's heritage could have been a force for good, Humanity has proven to be its own greatest enemy, affirming that no good deed goes unpunished. Tempted by immortality, the monks went astray from their teachings. The residents of Mibu village forsook their humanity entirely. The Okami forfeited their lives being servants to the dragon deity, whilst their descendants became slaves to the great serpent. What of the implications of a Shora attaining eternal life? Who could survive their wrath? Not once did mankind pause and consider the value of their finite existence. Is immortality a prize worth dying to secure? The desire for immortality stems from the fear of death. However, it is the finality of death that gives life meaning. Without fear of death, can a warrior truly be brave? Without the uncertainty of the journey, can a destination be rewarding? A semblance of hope shines through the one-armed wolf, who was granted eternal life, but was prepared to surrender it in a heartbeat. For the greater good of humanity, the battle line between good and evil courses through the blood of every being. It's choosing to believe in the former that makes humanity worth fighting for, worth saving. The dragon's heritage and those connected to it. It is only right that they return home. The path before you will now be fraught with more hardships than ever before. But knowing you, you'll overcome them. Remember the first rule of the code. As your father, I order you to forsake your master. From this moment, he is your master no more. A true wolf would choose for himself how to use his fangs. If it is for the sake of preserving Ashina, I will seize any manner of heretical strength. How many times have you died and come back to life for my sake? One last time. Yes. Let's finish this. Hesitation is defeat. I told you that, didn't I?
Thank you very much for watching. This pretty much wraps up our Sekiro Shadows Die Twice story explained. We really hope you enjoyed it. And a huge thank you to our sponsor, NordVPN. Please take a minute to click on the first link in the description or go to nordvpn.com forward slash brothers code to receive a huge discount in addition to four months free on any two year plan. And also a huge thank you to those of you who have supported us over the last few videos. If you'd like to directly contribute to this channel and the content we make here, then head on over to our Patreon. There are lots of rewards including permanent early access to all of our future content. You can also have your name cemented in the credits of our videos and in the description. It's also a great way to keep up with the progress of our videos. We provide frequent updates regarding which stage of production we're up to and when we estimate the video will be released and it's just a great way to keep in touch with us. If you'd like our videos to reach a wider audience, please leave a like and possibly comment and let us know what you thought of the video. And if it's not too much to ask, please subscribe as we're looking to try and get 100k subscribers by the end of the year. And once again, thank you for watching.